Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. I uh, just want to say good morning, man. Um, if you're newer here, uh, my name is Joel, uh, lead pastor here at Crossroads, and you guys are in for a special treat today. But before we get into that, I just wanted to give a quick shout out. I know that we had uh, two weeks ago had called the students up, and last week they were at a youth retreat. And uh, man, I've just been hearing some amazing reports on what God was doing in our youth and in our students uh, at the East retreat. And um, so I know most of them come second service because of the, the, us having the service for them. But if you see any of the middle schoolers and high schoolers, man, just, just encourage them, man. Just let God continue to do what he started in them um, at the retreat. And then also, I'm just getting back from uh, Ukraine, uh, just seeing what God's doing there. And listen, man, it's, I mean, it's crazy. It's just this, it's this, it's this weird tension of, of despair and war along with hope and God and seeing what God is doing. And, uh, you know, just had just such a great trip seeing God minister and all, everywhere we went. And a lot of open ears, a lot of open hearts that are really seeking what God has to provide. And, and if you don't know, I actually, I actually um, brought, brought with me one of the, uh, if you've been at Crossroads, you've met him before, but Vadim Klobos from Ukraine, he's with us. And, um, and, uh, and then we also, just so you guys know, we actually brought, um, as a fundraiser, we actually brought some uh, hoodies and shirts and vests and all that type of stuff uh, from Ukraine. And, and we're actually going to have it out on the merch table and all, 100% of that goes to uh, what God's doing in Ukraine. So, so literally like, the church is seeing zero of that. We're just passing it through and, and sending that straight to Ukraine. So if you guys want, you're more than welcome after service. And, and Vadim will actually be there, especially if you're going to be going with me uh, in June on our missions trip to Ukraine. It would be great to meet him because he's going to be hanging out with us the whole time that we're there. So with that said, uh, I know there's, there's like a lot of big stuff in that, but we don't have time for that. So but I actually wanted to uh, just take a moment and introduce our guest speaker. And he led us in our Empowered Conference yesterday. But if you don't know him, Mike Tergiano and his wife, Shar, they've pastored for, I think the dinosaurs were just starting to get out playing. <laughs> no, I love this guy. And, uh, you know, but he is one of the OGs of the vineyard. You know, he, he's seen the, the, all the amazing things that God's done over the past decades in the church, through the vineyard. And, and he's spoken personally, Christine and I, both him and Shar, have just spoken so much into our lives as we've pastored. And so it's a real pleasure to have you, brother. Let's give him a hand. Mike Tercioli. Well, it's, it is a, a, a joy and uh, I take it as a, a, a privilege to be back here. Uh, uh, it's been a number of years, but I, I feel like uh, somehow over these years and over the course of Crossroads, becoming a vineyard church, watching it grow, watching uh, Christina and Joel and the leadership team develop, over the years, and just having a little teeny part to play in that has made me feel like, well, this is part of the family, you know, that I'm part of, and I'm so proud of what goes on here. You guys represent something really, really, really good in terms of what the vineyard is all about. You know, there's a balance of, of, of life here, you know. You take the gospel very seriously, but you also know how to have fun and love each other. And that's, that's not something to take for granted, you know. Uh, so it's great to be here. I bring big, big love from the Vineyard family in uh, the greater New York area. They send their love to you guys, you know. So, uh, yeah. I want to talk about... <coughs> 
power and weakness. You know, if we're honest, weak, uh, weakness frightens us. You know, we all want to feel bold and powerful and in control. Okay? And the common perception is that weakness equals lack of power. But not as a Christian. See? In fact, if we want to fully enjoy the abundant life that Jesus promised us, we need to understand and accept a, a, a whole new concept, you see? And that is that our weakness is an opportunity to experience the power of God in our lives. See? I'm going to confess to you, I don't like being weak. I don't like admitting I have weakness, I don't like feeling like I'm the only person in the world that has weakness and I'm doomed because of it. Uh, there was a time that I felt ashamed of my weaknesses and I tried to cover them up. I've lied about them <laughs> I, or I berated myself because of them. I've pretended to be strong. I didn't like asking for help. Uh, I didn't feel like there was something I, you know, I didn't like that there was something that I simply couldn't do. Okay. I didn't like talking about my weakness. <laughs> you know, I even for a number of years, use drugs to keep a lid on my weakness. See? And this is all fear. See? The fear of missing out. See? Afraid my weakness might somehow disqualify me from some opportunity. A fear that my weakness might cause others to lose their respect for me. The fear of being stigmatized because of my weakness. Now, we are living in an image-conscious society. The world we live in wants us to believe that we have to be strong to conquer the hard things in our lives. And that's a lie. We only need to discover the one who can be strong for us. You see? and hand him our weaknesses. Okay. Now, the Apostle Paul knew all about this. Okay. You read 2 Corinthians, and it's a, it's a, a letter of, about weakness, power and weakness. You know, you know <coughs> power, prestige, were the way the ancient Greco-Roman world worked. See? That was the world in which Paul lived and ministered. See? His, his world loved appearances, image. See? Weakness was something that was looked down upon. A high premium was placed on looks, on wealth, social prominence, status, power. That was the Roman world. 
See? And they were more inclined to honor success and reward the winners in life. See? And they were more prone to ridicule and look down upon the weak, the powerless, the poor. See? For them, humility was weakness. It was degrading. See? Now, Paul planted this church and established in Corinth. Corinth, you might say, was kind of like the New York or the Las Vegas of, of the ancient world. Sin City. You know? <clears throat> but, you know, he planted this church, he established it, but after a while, the Corinthian church began to question his authority as an apostle. See? And the ringleaders of this, this, this uh, uh, mutiny see, uh, were so-called super apostles see, who, who had come to town challenging Paul's authority and vying for power. See? Now, they, were, they had flair. You know, they were polished and entertaining. You know, they made a lot of money, you know, captivating their audience with their slick preaching. You know, the Corinthians were wild over these guys. They were enamored by them. Kind of like today's celebrity pastors, you know? They were treated like rock stars. Now, Paul, on the other hand, was the opposite of what these image-conscious, power-smitten Corinthians desired. He didn't embody any of the traits that they valued. Paul apparently didn't have an impressive physical appearance. He, did, he lacked the forcefulness and the swagger that they were looking for, you know. He was meek and gentle in his leadership. He didn't speak eloquently. They even found the fact that he intentionally refused to get paid, refused to take money for, the, for his services. It, they found it insulting to them. On top of all this, his track record of continual suffering and hardship didn't help things. They, to, these things, you know, uh, shipwrecks, beating, thrown in prison, all this trouble, uh, you know, all these things, you know, were signs of weakness in their, in their eyes. To them, his hardships said one thing. Loser. You know, it said that God couldn't be with him. Yeah, so much trouble. Like, how, God, how could God be with you? Right? Uh, that, he, that he was weak. That he was a second-rate apostle. And the Corinthians viewed these super apostles as being better in just about everything that Paul was doing. Now, for many of us, our natural reaction is to prove ourselves and to prove those that think about that we're not that we're inferior. We prove they're wrong. That's our natural in, in, in inclination, right? We. Uh, or we try to keep up with those who say that they're better than us. Well, I'll show them. You know? We'll show them that, you know, it's natural to, to just show them that we're just as good as they are and show that they're wrong about us. Okay? But, but 
That's not what Paul does. He takes the opposite approach. Right? He boasts about his weaknesses. And so he writes to them, but he, he's talking about Christ, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. For the sake of, of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. What a list. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Crazy. Now, let's be clear about what Paul means here about weakness. Okay? This is open to opinion for many Bible scholars and everything, what Paul was saying about his weakness. But I think it's safe to say that he's not talking about sin in his life or bad choices that we make in life that we pay a big price for, All right? I think that he's referring to experiences, situations, circumstances, wounds that are hard to bear that we cannot remove from our lives. We have to live with them. Now, you know, you know the, the, these things like the, the hardships and the offenses and the insults, that, that love dictates that we simply humble ourselves and, you know, and, and just bear it, just live with it. See? Now, we might expect Paul to counter with a persuasive defense, right? Silencing the Corinthians with an overwhelming display of his authority as an apostle. This guy worked miracles, right? I mean, it was within his, you know, the realm of, like, well, I'll, just, I'll just put on a good show and I'll prove it to them, you know? Or at the very least, we might expect him to have covered up his weaknesses that that were the cause of all this criticism. But instead, Paul <laughs> shines the light even more brightly on his, the very weaknesses that caused him all this criticism. Putting, them, putting his weaknesses front and center rather than hiding them. See? Paul embraced the very things that the Corinthians rejected, identifying these weaknesses as signs of his true apostleship. See, he argued that weakness was actually proof of the power of God working through him. And he rejected the view, you know, of power as worldly success and bravado and status. Because for Paul, the power to dominate, to win at all costs, was in direct opposition with the nature of the gospel. For Paul, the gospel is the power of God to save through the weakness of Christ crucified. Okay. He viewed uh, uh, an embrace of weakness as an embrace of strength. 
Because when he was weak, he depended upon the strength of God even more. His weakness was the acceptance of God as his source of power. Now, in a previous letter that he sent to the Corinthians, uh, he told them to imitate him as he imitates Christ. So, in other words, embracing weakness and depending upon God's power is the way that all of us, all Christians, are called to live, not just, you know, an apostle. Because... It's the way of Jesus himself. <clears throat> Paul you know, said, uh, said, Jesus was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. Jesus, that was Jesus. That's the way he lived. He found power in his weakness as a human. And so this call to know the power of God in the midst of weakness is our calling. It's our calling in Christ today. See? We... We are are those who fully experience life only when we fully surrender our lives to him. We're called not to rely on ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead. And in an American culture that's so fixated on power and status and winners, a society that celebrates winners, you know, and uh, while, while hiding our weak, the notion of, of embracing our weakness and trusting in God for power seems utterly ridiculous. And, but, you know, while the, while the power, power and weakness displayed on the cross is foolishness to the world, right? To those who, who follow Christ, you and I, it's the true, you know, it's true power. That's where true power is found. See? We don't look to ourselves to overcome sin and become a better person or to become successful in the eyes of the world. We don't rely on our strengths and abilities to get things done in the kingdom of God. Rather, we're, God, we're called to look to God alone. See? Constantly clinging to his grace. See? Abiding, remaining. Constantly in his love. Trusting in his power alone. And when we do that, to our amazement, we become fruitful and experience true satisfaction and joy even. When we embrace our weakness and trust in the power of God, we put Christ on display in a world obsessed with, with, with forms of power that oppose the way of the cross. When we embrace our weakness and abide in God's strength, we bring glory to God. Now, looking back over my own, or my wife and I's journey with Christ, the times that we've experienced God's grace most powerfully, ironically, were the times that I know that I 
cried out to him in my darkest, weakest moments of loneliness and, and despair. I look back on those times, and that's when I, that was when I experienced his presence, even the most powerful. And those were the times where I grew as a human being. Crazy. Paradoxical. Upside down. It's not supposed to work that way, but it does. And I'm not making this up. It's written right here, the book. God's design is to make you and I, the church, a showcase for Jesus' power to a hurting a world that, that's just looking for hope right now. but not necessarily the way society would expect. Not by getting rid of all our weaknesses and making us winners in the eyes of the world, but by, by giving us strength to endure and even rejoice in our trials and in our hardships. I believe in miracles. I pray for the sick. I pray for uh, release of suffering. I pray for these things, but I realize that life is hard and not, and for some reason until Jesus comes back, there's going to be, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. I just know it. I believe in, the, in miracles. I pray for miracles, but I have to live with hardship and suffering nevertheless. There's a crazy mixture of the now and the not yet, the tension. Okay? I just want you to know that. I, I, I am full of hope for God breaking in at any time. That's cool. But I know the way life works. See? Becoming a Christian didn't make, make life easier. <laughs> it made it better, but not easier. So, oh. let me just end with this. Are you struggling with some weakness in your life? Some, something that, you, you know, a hardship, a disability situation that's just not going to change? Physical, emotional, you know, something that's just been given you to bear in life. Right. Again, I'm not talking about some specific sin in your life that you have stubbornly held on to and you're paying a price for it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just circling it out of your control. Maybe you've even gotten mad at God about this. Maybe today you're at war with God because he's not, you know, you've prayed and prayed and prayed and he hasn't taken this away. <clears throat> what would it look like for you to gladly embrace Christ's power in that specific weakness. I know it's hard to, to admit, admit to weakness, especially in front of others. But this morning, I believe Jesus is inviting you to trust that Thing, that weakness. Put it in his hands and depend on his life living in you to give you the strength and the power to even become fruitful in your life, in your circumstances, to glorify him. I believe he's, he, he, is, he is inviting 
Some of you that have been uh, uh, struggling with some weakness, some disability, some circumstance, to trust him and watch the power of God be revealed in and through you. Before I go any further, you might be here and, and you have not, you see, it starts with having Jesus at the center of our lives. I mean, we can't get the, all this power and weakness stuff is not a human thing. Okay, it's a Jesus thing, living in our life. So if you're here this morning and you have not placed Jesus at the center of your life by letting him be the king, like by, by inviting him to, you know, by surrendering your life to Jesus as your king, as your savior, I, that's the first step. And, and you'll never get past this thing until you let Jesus in. So even now, as I'm talking, I want to pray for, I, you know, you never know. You might, you might be sitting here listening to this, and I, I want to give you the opportunity in this moment for, the, for, for you to, to invite him into your, your life and let him set up shop in your life so he can live in and through you. So why don't we do this? Before I go any further with this and close, close your eyes and, and let, let's, I want to pray for anybody here that has not surrendered their life to Jesus. Lord Jesus, Today, I open my, 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 my life to you as best as I can right now. I surrender myself to you. I know, Lord, that they say you died for me, you rose from the dead, but I, today, I'm willing to give myself to you and to learn about you and to begin to follow you as best I can. So here I am. Come. Come. Take my life. Be my king. Amen. And if you said, if you're here and you said that prayer, okay, that's this is just the beginning. So you're going to need some help. And, and, and you're in a good place for that, you know? And, and so after the service, if you, set, if you, if you uh, that was your prayer, go to the Crossroads Center. They'll give you some information on what next steps you can take to, to start to live this new life, okay? All right, now we, now we really end this thing. If you're here this morning and you, and, and you'll respond, yes, I, I'm living with this weakness. And I, I need to, to discover Christ's power in the midst of this. I'm, I'm willing to invite him into my, into my weakness and depend on him. See? I have a prayer that, you know, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud, but make it yours. Okay, let's stand. Let's everybody just stand. And those of you that are, this is a message for you. You know who you are. And, and if these words that I pray right now capture your heart, you know, this is what you would love to say to Jesus right now. Guess what? He's listening. He's listening. Right. So, here it goes. Jesus, I acknowledge my weakness. I am weak, but you are strong. I need you. I surrender my weakness to you. Pour out your spirit on me 
and demonstrate your power in my weakness. Make me powerful in your grace so that when I'm weak, I can be strong in you. Amen. You know, you might have to pray this prayer over and over for a while. But as you exercise your trust and faith this way, this is what you're doing. You're putting your trust into Him right now. But as you do that, as you continue to say this kind of prayer, right, watch how the presence and power of Christ will take up residence in the middle of your weakness. And in a year from now or so, when I come back, you can tell me a story. That this wasn't a bunch of baloney. That this really is true. We can be strong in our weakness. We can find power in our weakness. Okay?